Greetings, welcome back to Astro Gaster. Yeah, sorry about the wood. Hey, mistress, what brings you? I am come about my lover who has lately returned from Ireland. Sorry. Ah, yeah, and your current lover is, as I recall, ah, yes, your lover at present is Owen Wood, the Reverend Dean of Armagh, is it not? Aye. And according to my notes, you were afeard he might die in battle, and yet you do not appear to be much pleased he is returned alive. Uh, whatever is the matter, madam? It is being said around the diocese that my lover, Owen Wood, is romantically entangled with two other women. Sorry. And who might these two other women be? Might one of them be his wife, or...? Of course not. Do not jape with me, Foreman. For as you very well know, what you told me about Dean Wood reforming and becoming a loyal husband turned out to be naught but boil brain. I did hear that one of the ladies Owen is seeing is Mistress Ways. For the other is a certain Anne Hayborn, with whom I am not yet acquainted. I do hear she is a very young and comely maiden, though mayhap a maiden no longer. <laughs> I prithee, uh, scribble one of those doodles of yours and tell me if this be true. It's yes, probably true. If you will but afford me some silence and calm, I will compose one of my doodles, as you so call my mathematically precise astronomical charts, and endeavour to answer your question. To wit, is Owen Wood, the Dean of Armagh, wooing other women? Hmm, that's a precise question. Well, what I wanted to check is... No, the Archbishop name is Whitgift, so... No, we don't have him here. Who's Mary Payne? Okay, I remember who she is. Okay, okay, get it. Owen Wood, to everyone's great surprise, will abandon his ranch chasing. No, he won't. Oh, he might, because Owen Wood is deceiving Alice and winning other women. But Alice may be optimistic for his relationships with this woman are married by this card. Wait, what? Oh, I did that? No. I cannot click the C for some reason. What the hell? I cannot see whatever whatever is under C. I don't know why. Okay, so we go with A. Ah, I have good tidings for you, mistress. Your relationship with Owen Wood is secure. It is true, he has indeed been conducting intimate liaisons with some of the wives and daughters of various deans and bishops, but... So then tis true! Yes. What a maid-fiddling maggot of a man is he! Aye, but pretty, madam, I, I had not finished. The stars suggest that Dean Wood's affairs with these women will shortly end. For it seems he is in dispute with them. What? With all of them? At the same time? No. It would seem so. Mayhap they all have been apprised of the same rumour that brings you this day. Well, I am glad to hear these affairs are soon to be ended. But I will not lie, I am no less vexed with him. And indeed, if Owen has been larking about, it is only fair I do the same. To even things out between us. Ah, I think what you may be referring to is Lex Talionis. It is the law of retaliation, as practiced by the ancient Babylonians. Well, madam, indeed, if it would help square matters betwixt you and Dean Wood, you may consider me wholly at your service. Oh, well, okay, I guess. I don't know why I couldn't, I couldn't cho choose, you see? Hello. God give you good evening, Your Grace. I trust you were pleased with the previous counsel I gave you? The advice I gave against granting Owen Wood the Bishopric of Salisbury. Ah, yes. Your yes. counsel did indeed prove sound. 
For Dean Wood is now cods deep in scandal. The parish council has received numerous paternity suits. Ooh. And it is said that scores of defiled wenches throng the gates of his deanery each morning, clutching suckling babes and demanding recourse. As for young Anne Hayborn, she has had her reputation ruined, and Dean Ways is barely speaking to his wife anymore. On my word, how disgraceful. Aye, indeed. If only Owen had the sense to exercise more discretion. Ah, uh, yes, indeed, Your Grace. The Bishop of London, for instance, manages his affairs very quietly. I might have been able to look the other hmm. way. But in this instance, I could not let Owen's indiscretions pass. For a wretched local woman by the name of Mary Payne got wind of the scandal and stirred up a public fuss about it. Oh, the devil take the woman and her bacon-faced husband. If I might venture an opinion, Your Grace, mayhap if we were to pay no heed to Mary Payne and her ilk, they would eventually tire of their animus and leave us all be. Uh, but is it upon such problems you come this day, or upon some other matter? I am come about my health. I believe I do ail of something. Then pray, describe your complaints to me, Your Grace. Well, I am afflicted with pain in my back. Okay. At times I find myself hard of breathing. Okay. Indeed, I feel I may have phlegm in my chest, and I do bear these odd-looking spots upon my body that will not mend. If you will permit me to loosen your robes to examine you? Oh, I... I see. Uh, methinks I have a notion of what ails you. Let me confirm it with a reading of the stars. What troubles Archbishop Whitgift? John Whitgift is troubled with muttering in the breast. It causes chest pain, which is occasioned by corrupt foam having got it in the chest. That sounds like it. John Whitgift is afflicted with knobs on the yard, a disease oft associated with lechery and characterized by wart like growths on the privy member. John Whitgift is suffering from the French pox, a venereal disease occasioned by lying with a pocky person. It is characterized by persistent sores on the arms and legs, short widedness, and bodily ache. Maybe that's one. So, to this, the Cancer or the Scorpio? I'll go with this one because he has the Your Grace, spots. I know not how to put this delicately. Uh, you have the French pox. I am not sure how this is possible as you're a man of the cloth. Indeed, mayhap I check the stars again. No need. I did suspect as much. Uh, verily? How astute of you. The French pox can oft be difficult to cure, but in your case, it is not far advanced. Uh, this ointment of ball grease and mercury is to be applied to your entire body. It must be rubbed in vigorously to ensure the mercury is well absorbed into the skin. You may then expect to see the sores on your body start to heal within a matter of days. I see. And uh, yes. I imagine your manservant, William will be giving me this treatment? Uh, no, Your Grace. Uh, the grease is to be taken home with you and applied each night before bed for nine days. Mayhap your uh, chaplain could apply it to Your Grace's body. Ah, yes. A fine idea. What? I thank you for this treatment, sir. Fare you well, Dr. Foreman. Uh, before you leave, Your Grace, uh, might I inquire again? Oh, stop it! Your Grace did mention you would give it careful consideration. Ah, yes. Indeed I did, did I not? Have no fear, Dr. Foreman. My chaplain is looking into it. Good day. Why everyone's trying... Whoa, that was very good. Trying to get William into bed. He is alive. Give ye good morrow, my lord. I trust your lordship is well this day. Well? 
God's body, am I likely to be well? I don't know. I have been languishing under lock and key while all England goes to ruin. Ah, yes. I did hear something of your arrest. I take it your encounter with the Queen did not go as well as planned. Nay, t'was a disaster. I took the precaution of seeking an audience with Her Majesty just after dawn to be sure I would find her alone. But when I entered her bedchamber, she let out such a blood-curdling scream it alerted the palace guards who ran into the room and arrested me. But you were imprisoned in your York House residence, were you not? The fact that you were placed under house arrest and not imprisoned in the tower surely speaks to the Queen's fondness for you. I trust your time in confinement was not uncomfortable, at least. Well, yes, my time away from the world and its trifling concerns did, in truth, prove useful. Thank it you. It afforded me time to reflect on larger questions, to take stock of my life and put recent events in perspective. Ah, I see. And what resolution did this quiet period of sober reflection bring you? A, a closer relationship with God? Or perchance you are resolved to spend more time with your family? What? No, of course not. I said my mind was turned to larger questions. To wit, am I destined for greater things? Am I chosen by God to rule a kingdom? For I must needs act. The realm is under threat from within. Uh, what? For why was I verily imprisoned? Was it merely to punish me for some trifling mistakes I made in Ireland? Nay, t'was to separate me from the queen. Well, I imagine after discovering you in Her Majesty's bedchamber... Do you not yet see? No. The Privy Council means to keep me away from Whitehall, lest I see how they have contrived to control and manipulate the Queen since I left for Ireland. My lord, are you saying the Queen is weak and no longer in control of her reign? Aye, indeed. Something must be done about it. Uh, well, man, do not just stand there. Uh, yes, of course, my lord. Uh, let us see whether the stars may give you your answer. Is Robert Lord Devereux, Earl of Essex, destined to... Uh, Rule England. Um, Devereux should use his substantial wealth to cleverly ensure a cooperation with his plans. In short, if he should engage in bribery. Robert Devereux is a strong authority figure. The Queen's failure to produce an heir will have violent consequences. Robert Devereux suffers from geopolitical ignorance. A foreign sover sovereign is destined to rule England. Deveroo, sorry, Deveroo is deluded about his, about his legacy. If Deveroo does not reign in his ambitions, he will die. Deveroo would do well to limit the influence of his friend's advice upon him. Deveroo is secretly motivated by his feelings about the Queen and how he has been treated by her. Yeah, I think that's it. My lord, the stars give you warning against paying heed to the Council of Friends. Was it, perchance, a friend who planted the seeds of these suspicions? To wit, your lordship's concerns regarding the Privy Council? Indeed, it was my friends who applied the <laughs> threat, but I see no reason to doubt them. My lord, for the sake of your safety, I must ask you honestly. Is it verily plausible, this notion that you were imprisoned on the Privy Council's orders to hide some manner of grand conspiracy or might the truth be far simpler, though harder to bear, that the Queen had good reason to punish you, and you are now vexed that you are no longer her favourite? Of course, I say this with the greatest respect and the greatest of- What? God's teeth, man! What is in you this day? Indeed, I will not suffer to be lectured in such a manner. It is apparent such complex affairs of state are far beyond the understanding of a commoner. Forsooth, a mere astrologaster. I bid you a final adieu, for methinks I will have no need of you henceforth. But my lord, I... my duty is clear. For the sake of the realm and the safety of its people, I must act without delay. Uh, Good luck. Oh, we're so close. Should have lied to him. Good day, Dean Blag. Uh, 
How now, good sir? I see you do ail of something. I do ail of something, foreman. Forsooth, I fear I am very ill indeed. What happened? I tremble day and night with fever, and my face does itch and prick with pain. Hmm, verily. You do exhibit upon your nose and cheeks a rash of a most remarkable hue. Oh. Before you do this reading for me, foreman, I must have your word that you will not speak of this to my wife, Alice. I will tell her if she asks. I, I have had her believe that I was set upon by an angry swarm of wasps that have lately been nesting in the north transept of the cathedral. I do understand. A kind husband would naturally wish to shield his wife from any undue distress. Ah, yea, that of course. Uh, and there be also the small matter of the promise I did make to restore the Blag family fortune what did you do? I died. And uh, oh. thus not leave my wife and children to live in penury when I am gone. If Mistress Blag were to think that I am gravely ill, it would provoke some uh, awkwardness between us that I would rather wish to avoid. Ah, I take it then that your your finances are also in poor health. Alas, they are. For as you accurately predicted, the Archbishop never did grant me the Bishopric of Salisbury. It would seem his grace is content for me to remain in my current state of penury. I see. Well, as to your wife, Alice, be not afeard, sir. We doctors take current confidentiality most seriously. As Hippocrates did say, testa Apollinum Medicum Secreta, uh, among other things. Now, mayhap we proceed to consult the stars on the matter of your condition. With what disease is my querent Thomas Blagg troubled, and how may he be cured? You know, wash yourself once in a while. Black suffers from erysipelas, a severe skin disease on the face that is accompanied with pain and fever. That will be it. Black is troubled with evil digestion. No. Black suffers from a bone shawl, being a knob like growth rising on the shin. The, on the shin, yeah. Yeah, I'll go with this one. It would seem you are troubled with a severe disease of the skin known as. Erysipelas. It is quite serious. Though you may find some temporary relief from the pain and fever by vigorously purging from your fundament. Uh, to induce such a thing, I do advise the consumption of a considerable quantity of prunes, or mayhap rhubarb. Uh, of course, it does depend on the season. Erysipelas? Prunes? <sighs> oh, merciful Lord, if it be thy will that I should die. And if thou hast writ these mortal signs upon the stars, I beseech thee, have thy servant Simon Foreman speak the truth. Pretty, pretty, sir. I, I had not finished. Oh, my dear friend, I will not lie to you. Your condition is quite advanced. In truth, I fear you must prepare for the worst. If you will not share this grave news with Mistress Blagg, uh, perchance you might speak to her from the safety of, uh, well, from beyond the grave? That is to say, write her a letter that may be read to her after you're gone. Your loving words, though thus delayed, may provide her comfort in her time of grief and destitution. God bless you for your candor, sir. You're welcome. As well your wisdom and friendship these last years. I will now go and pray upon what you have told me. Mm -hmm, it was the last one. For him. Okay, but what's left? Lancelot more than Whitgift is nearly there. Wait, I will not receive O oh, from Robert. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so will you, that was the last one for him. Oh. Yeah, I should have lied to him. But we have a chance with Alice, with Lancelot, the last one, and with John, the last one as well. People, oh, this is the lad. Maybe even with Emma. Okay. I have viewers already.
man. Thank you. Good day, Mistress Fortescue. How may I help you this day? You seem a, a little out of breath. Aye, tis but my bodice. My maidservant did lace it far too tightly. Methinks she is a trifle vexed with me. Indeed, the atmosphere in the Fortescue household is exceeding ill at present. Verily, and why is that? Someone has been stealing food from the larder in the night. Mm. This morning, three whole swan pies were missing. Each member of the Fortescue household suspects another. And whom do you think is the author of these thefts, madam? Well, I suspect my son Harold, as his fondness for pie is well known. But Harry denies it and has accused our maidservant Gladys. And tis true that Gladys has become suspiciously wide about the girth of late. And as for Gladys, well, she is convinced the culprit is our African parrot, Sir Munchalot Grey. Definitely not a parrot. denied the accusation and blames my monkey. Ah, and who does your monkey blame? How now, Dr. Foreman? Be not absurd. Monkeys cannot speak. Ah, yes. Then tis fortunate that God can. Speak to us, that is, by way of the stars. <laughs> who in the Fortescue household has been sneaking into the larder at night to steal pies. Hmm. Well. Sybil's family and friends have exercised constraint and discipline in relation to the pies. Sybil Fortescue is a hypocrite. She needs to turn her finger to ac of accusation on herself for she ate all the pies. That might be she f said that the bodice is tight. Sybil's intuition about the Id identity of the pie thief is wrong. The solution to the mystery is Counterintuitive. The thief is the one suspect who has maintained their silence. The Fortescue children have been raised well, they know not to steal pies. Evil from a foreign country is indicated here. Mistress Fortescue is advised to make changes to her will, she must cut her maid servant out of it. Mistress Fortescue's maid servant is untrustworthy and aggressive. I have I'm afraid that this will turn the aggression on monkey. So I'll go with this one. Madam, I have both good and bad tidings for you from the stars. First, the good tidings. Neither your son, your servants, nor your pets are responsible for the thefts. Excellent. Indeed, that is well to hear. And the bad tidings? Oh my days! You mean to someone from outside? A burglar has been entering our house during the night to raid our larder. Ah, uh, nay. I am not quite sure how best to put this. The bad tidings are that, according to the stars, the pies are being stolen by you, madam. By me? But do you jest, Dr. Foreman? Hmm. Doubtless the theft of our pies seems trifling to you, sir. Methinks I shall take my leave now and not importune oh. you any further. Okay. Well, I have your others, so I don't really care. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. What brings you so late this evening, young sir? Have you come from the playhouse? Yea, I'm come from playing a duchess in a special performance of Richard II. Nice. You know, that play that makes the Queen look bad. So, Mr. Shakespeare decided to revive his play, did he? I see. I need you to tell me what to do about my pay. Our seamstress told me she heard Mistress Burbage discoursing how John Crisp is getting paid a full shilling for each performance. And you feel this is unfair, I take it? I gather Mr. Crisp's pay is greater than yours. Aye, sir. Tis for twice as much coin as they pay me. What I get is barely enough to cover my rent. And my parts are well bigger than his, isn't it? And you can fathom no reason for this disparity in pay? He is more experienced, perchance. What? I've been on the stage since I was a boy. And John's been playing for less than a year. Nay, sir. Mr. Burbage and them other company shearers are paying me less on account of our doing the lady parts. That might be true. You say you are being paid less simply because you perform lady roles. 
Indeed. John only gets them main parts because he's big and tall, but I'm well better than he is. Critics call my Ophelia the most tantalizingly nubile and tragical performance since Henry Condell's Juliet. Ah, yes. Having seen Hamlet, I would have to agree with them there. I must own that I too found your Ophelia most comely and alluring. Don't. <clears throat> Let, now, let's see what the uh, stars advise. What can be done about you being paid less than players of masculine roles? Let's see. Humphrey should wait. Pay equi equity will come in time. Humphrey can solve his problem by using his romantic allure to seduce a woman. Humphrey should continue to perform his duties and remain quiet about the dis discrepancy in pay. Secrets are allowing Humphrey's employer to behave hypocritically. Humphrey must uncover the truth about what his, his colleagues are paid. Humphrey's employers are shrewd businessmen. Humphrey's boss will do evil to others if it means safeguarding his legacy. Humphrey's boss wife is pregnant with a masculine child. His boss can travel not be trusted. I will go with that. According to the stars, your employers, the Lord Chamberlain's men, are very wise businessmen. How do you reckon that? On account of them contriving to pay me less than I deserve? Precisely I don't get it so, either. Mr. Bell. And being so wise, they doubtless deter their hired men from discoursing upon the coin they receive for their labor. Perchance to the extent where the men harbor such feelings of shame and suspicion about it, they would more readily show each other their privy parts before they would show their pay. Aye, tis true enough. We oft pull our yardles out when we're jesting about and that. But as for a man's pay? Forsooth, tis considered most private. Well, such prudery must end if you and your fellow players are to advance your interests, Mr. Bell. Indeed. <laughs> Methinks that if you were all to begin freely discoursing upon these matters, you will find you are not the only player being paid unjustly. If you do decide to demand more coin from your employers, I advise you to unify with the other hired men and speak as one voice. So, we shall unify and demand them company share us pay us equal coin for equal playing. Did I just create a... <laughs> What? The workers' party? Okay. But that's gonna be it for today. Stay alive and see you soon.